file. Did I go through getting it off the file server? Okay, uh, go to your desktop. Uh, this thing called my file on SC vault. On the desktop. If you double click on that, um, you get to this directory that says 279 installer. Go from 
one kilohertz, which is uh, will exclude those well, some of those bearded seal sounds. Um, and then we go up to eight kilohertz. And we use um, 50 percent uh, and um, no way to put up percentile. Every put around the spectral peak. Um, how about these? interfering sound is present in these things. It's a, it's a few hundred hertz worth, I would say. Um, the numbers for dolphin whistles, the numbers are in, in the range of a few hundred hertz for these two numbers. <laughs> Again, the duration, we're going to just keep the number we have for the dolphin. Again, the duration, two seconds. Yeah, that's good. Minimum separation time, point uh, one half of it. Thank <laughs> you. 
transitions from one spectrum map frame to the next, because it has to move 300 hertz or less. That number might need to be bigger for beluga whales, because they have pretty steep frequency sweeps sometimes. The duration for calculating the target frequency um, is again what it is measured a frequency contour and it's trying to extrapolate to where it's going to come out next. It's using a 20th of a second appropriate for belugas because their whistles can wiggle pretty fast. Um, and so you want to use a pretty short time to calculate the target frequency. If you use a long time, it's going to kind of expect the whistle to be pretty constant and, and not change really fast. Um, but if you use a short time like this, a 20th of a second, um, it'll, um, <coughs> uh, it'll, it's more appropriate for like, animals. Like this. this says that it was last to be 0.2 seconds to count, and my minimum separation time. Is, um, separation time is when whistles cross each other. Um, they have to stay separated after they cross for a tenth of a second to count as as different whistles, because uh, otherwise they'll, they'll get more together. Um, you need to be higher. Um, I just practice. Fifty percent uh, works fairly well. Um, like I said, the other one, seventy-five percent, might work well too. Let's see what we get. Um, didn't even change it much. Um, basically, you want a number there that's low enough. I, I could even. I think with this sound, it's saying the loudest 10% of the um, of the sound in any time slice is what I'm going to look for a frequency contour in. And I think for all these whistles that I care about, uh, it's going to be in the loudest 10% of the sound. Um, so I could I could make that number as high as 90%, and it still gives me a reasonable. Um, we will be putting some of these uh, whistle detectors onto the website, and um, I've found that for a lot of the dolphin whistle detectors, um, the only thing you really need to change is the frequency range that they operate in. All the other numbers can stay the same. So you'll be able to download one of those, and if it's a different species of dolphin than the one we designed it for, you know, maybe change the frequency range, but the rest of it should work okay.
also hear that there are humpbacks present. We hear a lot of noise that are constant sound is eliminated with the equalization. Um, so that's all that's all in the sound file. Uh, so now we want to um, make a, um, a detector for this sound. And I stretch it out so I can see one of these. Um, it looks like a frequency con contour. So whistle and moan detector. The frequency range I want to operate in is, I don't know, um, 20 kilohertz up to 1.8. That's where they occur. And then percentile threshold type. Let's try leaving those alone. Let's see how well it works. Neighbor can put around each peak. So here we're operating in the uh, range where it's, you know, if, if you look at the help sweeps, the Mickey whale boing um, can change fairly fast at the beginning, but then slow down considerably. Um, so we're just detecting that part of the frequency contour. We probably get away with the neighborhood. You know, this is 200 hertz here. You know, changing by a quarter of that or less, so let's say 50 hertz for our neighborhood. How far from which it, uh, uh, how separate a peak has to be from its neighbors and how much it can change from one frame to the next. The duration for calculating target frequency, here we can use something bigger than what we have here, because um, Minky Whale sounds change slower than those Beluga sounds did. Um, 0.05, and say 0.1. Probably a couple seconds long, how long it does it on that long kind of duration, let's say one second or minimum duration. And minimum separation time, we want to do that. How well is it working? Um, they're not in any 
<laughs> any unit that's easy to describe. Um, let me think, what would it be? It would be, they're, they're in native spectrogram units. Um, and so, which is that? One unit there would be not quite 6 dB, so one unit, no, no, one unit would be not quite 12 dB. Um, so uh, one unit would be about 10 dB. So by using five, that's about a 5 dB difference. Okay. So it's a, it's a tenth of a dB, I guess. Um, I, should, I should convert this to use decibels. Um, um, it's not using decibels right now. It's using a different logarithmic like unit. In this case, it's only let's see the detector is firing when it when it sees those Mickey Whale calls and it's returning a zero the rest of the time. So this is an exceptionally easy. Um, Detection function that's at a threshold for memory, less anything between zero and one or zero point nine or four. And we're getting most of those spikes, but not all of them. But the ones that are getting the most are the ones that are getting the most spikes. And it's possible that some branches are not trusted. Try making their branches a little bit brighter. See if that green come out. Um, it's nice to come up with a kind of 
quantitative measure of detector performance. There's also a question, a related question about how high should I set my threshold? Um, because uh, lower thresholds, you know, lower thresholds will get more detections, but will just get more wrong detections also. And um, higher thresholds, you know, get fewer and, and have fewer wrong detections, but they might miss some calls. Um, you can compare your detector to human detections. Um, human detections are, we usually call them ground truth. Um, that's where a person waits through a file and marks all the, all the calls that they see. And, uh, uh, and, and we use that as the best thing, uh, the, the truth to compare to our detector. Of course, humans are not infallible either and will miss calls. And you know, plenty of times you go through a sound file once and park the calls and then you come back later on and say, hey, I missed this one, I missed that one. Um, so, so nothing is infallible um, in terms of finding all the calls that are in there. It's also a question of how faint a call <coughs> you want to consider. Um, you know, there are always calls that are like at the edge of perceptibility where you're not sure if it's a call of your, your target species or not. Um, and so uh, what do you do about those ones? Um, you can also um, assess detectors by comparing to other detectors. And that's maybe the more useful thing um, for you know, the kind of work that we're doing where we're using detectors to, to um, look at large data sets because we have to use some kind of detector and so we just simply want to find the best one for our data set. Um, um, I will say that performance, when you assess performance, um, the performance of a given detector always depends on a bunch of things, um, but most importantly the noise level. But um, uh, how, how loud is background noise? What's the background noise like? Um, does it include uh, other things that sound similar to your target species? So for instance, if there are humpback whales around and your, your target call type is something that's in the range of humpback whales, well, humpbacks make such a huge variety of different kinds of sounds that they can confound detectors all the time. Um, more generally, yeah, environmental conditions matter. You know, are there, are there, are there ships present um, and, and are there confounding species and whatnot? When you talk about a performance measure, it's always for a certain data set. Um, this is something that people miss all the time. They go and measure performance of their detector and say, here's my, my detection performance curve, which will, I'll show you what that means in a few minutes. Um, uh, that's not the detection performance curve. That's a detection performance curve for the data set that you use to evaluate it. Some data sets are nice and clean. Um, they have very few interfering sounds and low noise levels, and the calls are nice and clear. And so it's pretty easy to detect sounds in them. And that makes the detector look really good. It can have a really good performance curve. But if you take the same detector and run it in a noisy environment, it's, it's going to degrade. They all do. And um, so when somebody talks about uh, detector performance, it's, you have to pay attention to what data set they're, they're working on and how clear the call's in it. Also, performance can vary from time to time and place to place. You know, different species sound different in different places, and especially in noise environments are different in different places and at different times. Um, so you need to pay attention to that also in, in thinking about detector performance. Sometimes you need different detectors for, for different situations, um, different places or different times. Now, when we start looking at a detector um, uh, to, to assess its performance, um, we start with a ground truth data set where we have a person go through and do their best job they can at finding all the calls that are in the data set. Um, and then we run the automatic detector and find out which of the calls it finds. How many of those, you know, say a person found a thousand calls in this data set, how many of those thousand did the detector find? How many false detections did it make of things that were not really calls that a person found? And there's, those numbers are usually expressed in a matrix like this. Um, uh, so desired representation means that there, there's one present, a person has verified that there's a, say, a Minky Whale call. We're going to look at the Minky whale, whale example here. There's a Minky Whale call present, and it was detected by my detector. Over here, we have a Minky Whale call present, but it was not detected by my detector. Um, uh, and so we can count the number of calls um, for this data set and this detector that were in that category. There's um, sounds in the, in the data set that are not 
my target species. It's not the desired vocalization. So anything else in there. So this is a, something we don't want to detect. Um, if we get a detection of it, it's called a false detection, wrong detection. Uh, so we will count the number of those. And finally, there are things that are not the call of interest and we, we don't detect them. If you're counting those, um, there's a, a fourth parameter. So these are correct detections. True positives is another name for them in this category. B is a false negative, because it was um, a call of present, but we didn't find it. So the detector said negative. No, there's nothing there, but there was. It's a wrong negative. In statistics, this would be called a type 2 error. Um, it's also called a miss, you know, a call that the detector missed. Down here, the names for this are false positive. It was detected, but there wasn't anything we care about that was there. Type 1 error in statistics, a wrong detection is another name. And D is a correct non-detection. So these are correct detections, correct non-detections, and then the two kinds of errors you can make. People use a variety of statistics. Um, some of the most popular ones are the false positive rate, which is um, uh, what fraction of the calls that were detected are in fact um, uh, are in fact correct. Um, or no, sorry, false, false positive uh, are incorrect. So these are the incorrect detections. It was detected, but it wasn't a call. And so we say, of all the um, things that were detected, what fraction of them are correct? False negative rate um, is um, the number of um, calls, number of times there was a call present, which is this line right here, call present, and we missed it. So that's the false negative rate. Precision and recall are often used together. Uh, precision is the number of times the a call was detected <coughs> over um, total number of detections. It's the same as the false positive rate. And recall is um, <coughs> uh, also another name for the false negative. Uh, you know, it's, the, it's the inverse of the false negative rate. It's the times we detected something over all the all the times there was a call present. So recall plus false negative rate add up to one. Um, precision and false positive <coughs> up to one. So. Okay. This is a very small example of what's called a confusion matrix. Um, when you're talking about classifiers and things that can sort things into multiple categories, um, you have a bigger confusion matrix. Here we have two categories, is a call or isn't a call. Ground truth is a call or isn't a call, and detector says it's a call, and detector says it's not a call. Um, and so the confusion matrix is just two by two. Sometimes we have a bunch of categories that we're trying to say, you know, for sorting calls into clicks, we might have five or ten different kinds of dolphins, it could be. And if the classifier says it's a white sided dolphin, when in fact it's a bottlenose dolphin, um, uh, you can come up with this assist. The statistic of the number of, of times it makes that kind of mistake. And that's a bigger confusion matrix. So this is for detectors, where we're sorting things into yes, it's a call that I care about, or no, it's not. There are only two categories, and so it's a two by two confusion matrix. So um, two of the curves that are used, well, one of the curves that's used for um, assessing detector performance is called a receiver operating characteristic curve. Uh, the name comes from radar, where these things were first developed. Um, it plots the false positive rate on the x-axis. Um, so we want fewer false positives, so good performance is down here. And the true positive rate is on the y-axis. So we want true positives, those are correct detections. So we want to be up here. So performance in this corner is good. This is a fairly good performing detector. Um, this curve comes reasonably close to that corner up there. It's not. It's not perfect, obviously. It's not, it's not a great detector, but it's pretty good, I would say, for, for animal calls. Of course, I don't know what data set was run on, so I can't say in any absolute sense this is a good detector or not. But for this data set, um, this was a fairly good detector. It's an okay detector. Um, <coughs> just you can't see it. There are actually two different classifiers. There's another, there's a dimmer curve that doesn't show up here. Too. But, uh, Hey, just to clarify, so that's that curve is each potential level of threshold is. Oh yes, sorry. 
that's a, that's a really cool, good question. So the way this curve is generated um, is by varying the threshold. Um, so remember I said that um, you know if you have a low threshold, you make lots of detections because there are lots of peaks above it. Lots of detections, lots of correct detections, but also lots of wrong calls. Um, so wrong calls or false positives are made. So when I have a low threshold, I'm out here, I'm getting a bunch of false positives. I'm getting all the true positives, maybe I'm up at one on this axis. So I'm getting all the calls, but I'm getting a bunch of wrong detections also. As I lower the threshold, I travel this direction on the curve. Um, and so uh, I'm here, say I'm starting to miss about 10% of the calls that someone has found. Um, but I'm making many fewer false detections, you know, going from you know, nine tenths of the detections are wrong to you know, around here I'd be at I don't know, fifteen percent of the detections are wrong. If I lower the threshold even more, which I might do for really common species, I'm coming down to very few false positives. Um, I'm missing, you know, my true positive rate is a half, which means that I'm missing <coughs> half the things that are really in the data set um, that are that are calls. Uh, but maybe that's okay for a common species. It might be okay to miss a bunch of their calls and um, and be much more certain that something that's a detection actually is a, uh, uh, a correct detection. So this curve gives you a, um, a way to pick a threshold. Um, you know, if you're trying to find a common species, you want a few false positives. Um, so you can afford to pick a point on the curve that's down here and use a threshold value that corresponds to that, that measure there. If you're looking for a rare species, you want to be up in this part of the of the curve where you're, um, uh, sorry, let me get that backwards. Um, no, you can afford to have a lot of false positives for a rare species, but you're not, you're almost never going to miss a call that's actually present. Okay? So you can look at this curve and pick a point where you're comfortable. You know, if you're up here, you're missing 83% of the actual calls that are present, um, but you're going to get a lot of false positives you have to wade through to find, find the, the few actual calls that you care about. That might be okay. Another way of expressing similar data is something called the detection error trade-off curve. Um, uh, it expresses similar kind of data, um, false positive rate. Again, this is the same as the um, uh, um, false positive rate on the x-axis, like a, a rock curve. But it has the false negative rate on this axis. Um, so a false negative means, um, a negative means it was not detected. A false negative means there was something there that was not detected. So this is a miss, a false negative. Um, it's also plotted logarithmically. So here's 0.1, here's 1, here's 10. Up here would be 100, I guess. Um, uh, the reason for doing that is in rock curves, all the axes are kind of squished up into this corner. And um, by, by using log axes, you kind of spread that out so you can see more detail about what's happening in the, in the curve. Um, so this is a different way of expressing more or less the same data. Uh, on this kind of performance measure, stuff down near this corner is better. Um, uh, one caveat with using debt curves is because it's logarithmic, um, these axes extend on forever um, down in the down towards zero. You know, if you keep marching down here, you would get 10, 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and so on. And so whoever makes the curve has to choose what they want for their axis limits. Um, and so uh, you can make a curve look good by choosing axis limits of one and one. We would be seeing only only this part of the curve, and it will be way down there near the lower left corner where the good performance is. So you actually have to look at the numbers. I like to look at the 10, 10 point, 10% 10 false positives, 10% false negatives. And if the curve is close to that, that's that's pretty good performance. Just as a rule of thumb for calibrating between different debt curves, um, the 10% 10 point is a good reference point. how to make these things, these performance curves. Um, uh, we're going to use uh, 
uh, detectors that exist already. Um, you should have some detectors. Um, so we're gonna, first time in this we're gonna do a, a run of a big set of data. So let's see, let's load the three settings.
So first of all, we're going to load the So we're going to load the manual. 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 We're going to load the all right, and then open this now files. Oh, yeah, I did the same. Okay. All right, so I want to, when I detect a call, I want to write a log file entry. And so I'm going to um, first set up my call detection act, call detected action to do the right thing. So I click on edit actions. Pick that one and say edit. Gives me a little warning because call detected is a special action in this panel. It's the one that gets triggered when it makes a detection. Um, other actions are just one thing you do manually with either hotkeys or, or off the menu. And here I want to um, do logging. So I'm going to say um, so there's the actions name. I'm in height of detection. Height of detection peak is important um, because that's how it's that's what it's going to use to generate that. Um, the rock curve, it uses all of your detections in here and um, successively raises and, and lowers the threshold in later processing or, or simulates raising and lowering a threshold by throwing out detection peaks that are lower than, than um, a certain number that it's assigned. So picking that box for height of detection peak is, is important for performance analysis. That's my call detected action. I didn't have a log file, so let's make one. Um, text file. We want to do a text file for this one because that's what the software wants in a minute. Right. Oh yeah, that's where I'm going to put it. Put it in that same directory. Make the DCL model. Um, call the log file, name it um, something.log. Well, let's name it Mickey Detector 09. Okay. Oh, nine. So that's the name of our detector. This was a nice big oil detector drive that I hit. Um, dot log. Don't call it dot text. Um, again, it's really helpful to have your log files have a different name than dot text. And in fact, in this case, um, we don't want to have a dot text name because it'll, it'll mess up the Matlab code later on. Oh, no, Okay. Log file type. Name text file. Okay, now we. Yeah, so I'm loading settings. I can do it either by grabbing that file and dragging it into Ishmael. In this case, I'm doing load settings from Ishmael. I have the Mickey batch 21 files. Typically, we would just say file, open file, and then do control A and choose all the main files. In Windows 7, that works. In yeah. Windows 10, we're working on a workaround. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a workaround for getting those files. Because we're having such trouble opening, opening files. So this is a, a IPF um, that Sharon I'll show you what this looks like. I'll show you what this looks like. Just do file, open file, and select a bunch of files. Um, 
typically you click the first one and then hold on shift, but you click the last one and it'll select all the ones in between. So, or you use control A to select all. Um, but you want to you want to get the gotcha files into Ishmael. And this will get fixed because we use this all the time. Yeah. The thousands of files into Ishmael and it's never ever been. Yeah. 
they've moved that one text file out of the directory. Is there a text file in there? Remember the, um, so if you go into the Minky DCL, there is a Minky Boing Debt 09.txt. Oh. Kill that file. Yeah. What we're about to do, we'll think that that's a, a label file, an annotation file that has Thank you, Karen. That was um, the key point dead 09. That file there. Just delete that file. Right here, scroll down the line. 
K5. I put out a comment already that says Mickey Whale going to Moth Hawaii. We're going to put things in here. So the directory, uh, yeah, with the directory we'll, we want is the directory that has all of our sound files. Oh. So let's go back to our Mickey Whale directory. Yeah, so don't use the one in the manual. Yeah, the one in the manual was done on a different computer. And we didn't know how these computers here would be set up, so we can the one here. But if you go to your Mickey Whale sound file directory, again, click up at the top here, and you'll get the, the path turning blue. You just copy. And go back to that lab. Make sure there's a single quote before and after. Sure. So if I set all those things up, and then I 
run this MATLAB code, if I've done everything right, it will give me performance analysis. And you can look down below at the bottom, it tells us it's processing the files one at a time. I'll not be able to see this back there, but hopefully you can see it on your machine. And it gives me a figure. I'm going to resize this so I can see those rock and dead curves. So if it bombs and you want some help, raise your hand. So here, this is your this data set. Here's what the rock curve looks like. The rock curve ends up pretty close to the border. Pretty good for vector. In terms of the dead curve, here's the 10 10 point right here. And about right there. Our curve is pretty close to that, so it's a good detector. It's not a great detector. Um, Just because sometimes it's so If I wanted a, uh, a detector where I wanted to not miss very many calls, I wanted to miss only 2% of the calls, I would pick a threshold point corresponding to that, that point on the, on the depth curve. Um, um, and, you know, correspondingly for, for other points on the depth curve, I'm going to talk about. I mean, how do you how do you get get to your threshold? There's no threshold saying that we start adding five or whatever. They aren't shown on here. I can show you later. What I'm going to be doing is um, fixing this code so that you can just hover the mouse over the performance curve and it'll tell you what the correspondence oh, yeah. is. It's not there right now, but I'm, I'm going to be putting it in. We meant to do that before we get here. It's actually also on Yeah, that should just be Anybody else need help? Yeah. 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 Also, if you're having trouble with your parameters in that file, if you scroll down a little bit in that .m file, there's an example down below that shows correct syntax. So you can double check that your path and your extensions have the correct syntax. Oh, that way? I don't know. The way of thinking of this cool to body is just have it on the markers and then have different curves with different colors that correspond to different